22, The Hastening Saloon. From that day, Bond's recovery was rapid. He sat up in bed and wrote his report to M. He made light of what he still considered amateurish behavior on the part of Vesper. By juggling with the emphasis, he made the kidnapping sound much more Machiavellian than it had been. He praised Vesper's coolness and composure throughout the whole episode without saying that he had found some of her actions unaccountable. Every day, Vesper came to see him and he looked forward to these visits with excitement. She talked happily of her adventures of the day before, her explorations down the coast and the restaurants where she had eaten. She had made friends with the chief of police and with one of the directors of the casino, and it was they who took her out in the evening and occasionally lent her a car during the day. She kept an eye on the repairs to the Bentley, which had been towed down to the coach builders at Rouen, and she even arranged for some new clothes to be sent out from Bond's London flat. Nothing survived from his original wardrobe. Every stitch had been cut to ribbons in the search for the 40 million francs. The Le Chiffre affair was never mentioned between them. She occasionally told Bond amusing stories of Head of S's office. She had apparently transferred there from the WRNS, and he told her of some of his adventures in the service. He found he could speak to her easily, and was surprised. With most women, his manner was a mixture of taciturnity and passion. The lengthy approaches to a seduction bored him almost as much as the subsequent mess of disentanglement. He found something grisly in the inevitability of the pattern of each affair. The conventional parabola, sentiment, the touch of the hand, the kiss, the passionate kiss, the feel of the body, the climax in the bed, then more bed, then less bed, then boredom, the tears and the final bitterness. Was to him shameful and hypocritical. Even more, he shunned the mise-en-scene for each of these acts in the play, the meeting at a party, the restaurant, the taxi, his flat, her flat, then the weekend by the sea, then the flats again, then the furtive alibis and the finally angry farewell and some doorstep in the rain. But with Vesper, there could be none of this. In the dull room and the boredom of his treatment, her presence was each day an oasis of pleasure, something to look forward to. In their talk there was nothing but companionship with a distant undertone of passion. In the background there was the unspoken zest of the promise which, in due course and in their own time, would be met. Over all was the shadow of his injuries and the tantalus of their slow healing. Whether Bond liked it or not, the branch had already escaped his knife and it was ready to burst into flower. With enjoyable steps, Bond recovered. He was allowed up, then he was allowed to sit in the garden, then he could go for a short walk, then for a long drive, and then the afternoon came when the doctor appeared on a flying visit from Paris and pronounced him well again. His clothes were brought round by Vesper, farewells were exchanged with the nurses, and a hired car drove them away. It was three weeks from the day when he had been on the edge of death, and now it was July and the hot summer shimmered down the coast and out to sea. Bond clasped the moment to him. Their destination was meant to be a surprise for him. He had not wanted to go back to one of the big hotels in Royale, and Vesper said she would find somewhere away from the town. But she insisted on being mysterious about it, and only said that she had found a place he would like. He was happy to be in her hands, but he covered up his surrender by referring to their destination as Trou-sur-Mer, she admitted it was by the sea, and lauding the rustic delights of outside lavatories, bedbugs, and cockroaches. Their drive was spoiled by a curious incident. While they followed the coast road in the direction of Les Noctembul, Bond described to her his wild chase in the Bentley, finally pointing out the curve he had been taken before the crash, and the exact place where the vicious carpet of spikes had been laid. He slowed the car down and leant out to show her the deep cuts in the tarmac made by the rims of the wheels, and the broken branches in the hedge, and the patch of oil where the car had come to rest. But all the time she was distant and fidgety and commented only in monosyllables. Once or twice he caught her glancing in the driving mirror, but when he had a chance to look back through the rear window, they had just rounded a bend and he could see nothing. Finally, he took her hand. Something's on your mind, Vesper, he said. She gave him a taut, bright smile. It's nothing. Absolutely nothing. I had a silly idea we were being followed. It's just nerves, I suppose. This road is full of ghosts. Under the cover of a short laugh, she looked back again. Look! There was an edge of panic in her voice. Obediently, Bond turned his head. Sure enough, a quarter of a mile away, a black saloon was coming after them at a good pace. Bond laughed. We can't be the only people using this road, he said. Anyway, who wants to follow us? We've done nothing wrong, he patted her hand. It's a middle-aged commercial traveler in car polish on his way to La Havre. He's probably thinking of his lunch and his mistress in Paris. Really, Vesper, you mustn't think evil of the innocent. I expect you're right, she said nervously. Anyway, we're nearly there. She relapsed into silence and gazed out of the window. Bond could still feel her tenseness. He smiled to himself at what he took to be simply a hangover from their recent adventures. But he decided to humor her, and when they came to a small lane leading towards the sea and slowed to turn down it, he told the driver to stop directly they were off the main road. Hidden by the tall hedge, they watched together through the rear window. Through the quiet hum of summer noises, they could hear the car approaching. Vesper dug her fingernails into his arm. The pace of the car did not alter as it approached their hiding place, and they had only a brief glimpse of a man's profile as a black saloon tore by. 
It was true that he seemed to glance towards them, but above them in the hedge there was a gaily painted sign pointing down the lane and announcing L'Auberge du Fruit de Fondu, Croustance, Friture! It was obvious to Bond that it was this that had caught the driver's eye. As the rattle of the car's exhaust diminished down the road, Vesper sank back into her corner. Her face was pale. He looked at us, she said. I told you so. I knew we were being followed. Now they know where we are! Bond could not contain his impatience. Bunk him, he said. He was looking at that sign, he pointed it out to Vesper. She looked slightly relieved. Do you really think so? she asked. Yes, I see. Of course you must be right. Come on, I'm sorry to be so stupid. I don't know what came over me. She leant forward and talked to the driver through the partition, and the car moved on. She sank back and turned a bright face towards Bond. The color had almost come back to her cheeks. I really am sorry. It's just that... It's just that I can't believe everything's over, and there's no one to be frightened of anymore. She pressed his hand. You must think me very stupid. Of course not, said Bond. But really, nobody could be interested in us now. Forget it all. The whole job's finished. Wiped up. This is our holiday, and there's not a cloud in the sky, is there? He persisted. No, of course not. She shook herself slightly. I'm mad. Now we'll be there in a second. I do hope you're going to like it. They both leant forward. Animation was back in her face, and the incident left only the smallest question mark hanging in the air. Even that faded as they came through the dunes and saw the sea and the modest little inn among the pines. It's not very grand, I'm afraid, said Vesper, but it's very clean and the food's wonderful. She looked at him anxiously. She need not have worried. Bond loved the place at first sight. The terrace leading almost to the high tide mark, the low two-storied house with gay brick-red awnings over the windows, and the crescent-shaped bay of the blue water and golden sands. How many times in his life would he have given anything to have turned off a main road to find a lost corner like this where he could let the world go by and live in the sea from dawn to dusk? And now he was to have a whole week of this, and of Vesper. In his mind, he fingered the necklace of the days to come. They drew up in the courtyard behind the house, and the proprietor and his wife came out to greet them. Monsieur Vassois was a middle-aged man with one arm. The other he had lost fighting with the Free French in Madagascar. He was a friend of the chief of police of Royale, and it was the commissionaire who had suggested the place to Vesper, and had spoken to the proprietor on the telephone. As a result, nothing was going to be too good for them. Madame Versois had been interrupted in the middle of preparing dinner. She wore an apron and held a wooden spoon in one hand. She was younger than her husband, chubby and handsome and warm-eyed. Instinctively, Bond guessed that they had no children, and that they gave their thwarted affection to their friends and some regular customers, and probably to some pets. He thought of their life was probably something of a struggle, and that the inn was very lonely in the winter time, with the big seas and the noise of the wind in the pines. The proprietor showed them to their rooms. Vespers was a double room, and Bond was next door at the corner of the house, with one window looking out to sea and another with a view of the distant arm of the bay. There was a bathroom between them. Everything was spotless and sparsely comfortable. The proprietor was pleased when they both showed their delight. He said that dinner would be at 7.30 and that Madame la Patronne was preparing broiled lobsters with melted butter. He was sorry that they were so quiet just then. It was Tuesday. There would be more people at the weekend. The season had not been good. Generally, they had plenty of English people staying, but times were difficult over there, and the English had just come for a weekend at Royale and then went home after losing their money at the casino. It was not like the old days, he shrugged his shoulders philosophically. But then no day was like the day before, and no century like the previous one, and... Quite so, said Bond.